are so thrilled to be here tonight. This is the last of our, uh, uh, this year's Waters to the Sea stories. We are so thrilled to have had a great year with our storytelling. And we, uh, I'll say we, we saved the best class. So uh, we're gonna be focusing on Lake Superior. So a little bit of a twist. I know we had done a lot about uh, the Delta, the Mississippi River, and even a little bit about Hawaii. But now we're, we're gonna turn our attention uh, to the north, uh, the north of us, to uh, uh, the great lake uh, in the world, I'm going to say. Uh, we are so thrilled to be here. Uh, just a little bit about ourselves. If you've been here before, I'll kind of give the overview. Uh, our center, the Center for Global Environmental Education, is celebrating its 31st year at Hamlin University. Uh, Hamlin is Minnesota's oldest uh, university, founded in 1854. So uh, it's pretty cool that we are still around. And uh, we like to brag that the first two graduates of Hamlin were, uh, uh, were females, and they turned uh, the Soren sisters, uh, became teachers. And we come from the School of Education, so we're proud to continue that. Uh, that role of educating uh, folks in a wide variety of ways. My name is Tracy Ferdine. I'm the director of the Center for Environmental Education, and our mission is to foster environmental literacy and stewardship in citizens of all ages. Uh, and we have built on four cornerstones, professional development for teachers, a lot of you are educators, multimedia tools, we'll see some of those tonight, uh, the K-12 curriculum and community outreach. Uh, we believe that through an interdisciplinary lens of arts and science, we can come together to accomplish great things for our society and the environment. Uh, but enough about that. So tonight we are coming together uh, to uh, engage in our last Waters of the Sea stories for the year. Uh, it, we've done this for over two years now. The pandemic uh, drove us to do it, and we're very pleased how it's turned out. Uh, tonight is Waters of the Sea stories, the state of the lake and Minnesota's wild war. Uh, so we're going to get a little bit about uh, both about the land and the water, uh, which, in, as we call One River Thinking, is thinking about systems. Uh, we want to give a special thanks to the Morell Foundation. Uh, our friends down in New Orleans have funded uh, this series, and I asked them if it was okay to talk about the lake, and they said, yes, it's just fine. So thank you, uh, the Haynes brothers and folks down there. I also want to thank uh, Sarah Robertson for coordinating this. She's done a great job of making this happen. And uh, uh, now I'll move to a little bit of housekeeping. Um, uh, we will take uh, questions afterwards. We tend to have everybody speak. And then uh, please just uh, text or uh, use the, um, uh, the chat to send your questions. Uh, we will answer them at, uh, at the end. Uh, if you can keep your mic on the mute, uh, on mute, that'd be great. We all know how to use Zoom these days. Uh, you can keep your video on or off if you're so inclined. And uh, one of the fun things is this uh, webinar is recorded, and we've really seen that a lot of people can't make it. It's a, you know, if you've got something better, especially on a Minnesota night where it's kind of nice out, uh, a lot of folks are maybe out. I'm not sure what it's like up on the North Shore, but here in Minneapolis, it's become pretty nice tonight. Um, so with that, uh, let's do some of uh, the introductions. Let's see. There we go. Um, We'll start with Mark and Katya Gordon. Uh, Ka Mark, Katya and Mark have committed their lives to safely connecting people to nature and stirring people to action around climate change. Their sailing voyages on Lake Superior offer sailing adventures with a purpose for teachers, teens, and young adults. When not sailing, they are actively involved in the North Shore community. Now that's what they sent, but I can do better than that. Uh, I've known Mark for 44 years and Katya for only a mere 30 years. And I will say that these two are the, some of the most committed people I know uh, that live their values uh, of environmental literacy and stewardship. And I wanna give a big plug. If you're looking for something to do on Lake Superior this summer, they offer day trip sailing. Please check that out. We've taken uh, folks from, uh, actually our friends from New Orleans came up and I think they said, Mark said, if you fall over, I'll turn around to get you, but you might die. Uh, so, uh, cause the lake's so cold and he left, he's going, Chris is going, what? Uh, so you can get out and experience the lake with these folks. Um, they do some great uh, environmental education work. I believe your trips are filled right now, but I know, always know you're looking for young people that are in a transitional part of their life to go with you on your extended sailing trips. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if you need other folks, please feel free to ask if you do. Uh, but uh, these two have done some remarkable components. We're so thrilled to work with them. They have been working with us to 
get the waters to the sea, uh, Lake Superior Odyssey, use the shore. So it's one thing for us to make a tool. It's a totally another thing to get it used. And they've made a commitment. Uh, we've got grants. We're going to work together to get this tool used with folks with the schools on the North Shore. So thank you for your presentation tonight. Uh, Shell, uh, I'll read her, her bio. Shell has lived and worked in the Northeast Minnesota since 1974. She began her career with the United States Forest Service on the Superior National Forest and transitioned to a consulting botanist, forest, uh, and plant ecologist. Before retiring to the rest of her life in 2019, she thrived for a couple of decades as a lead plant ecologist and botanist uh, with the Minnesota Biological Survey, uh, responsible for planning, executing, uh, executing, and coordinating the survey's efforts in data collection, integration, mm -hmm. and interpretation, providing technical expertise on Minnesota plant communities. Um, I guess I've known uh, Shell for about 30 years as well, and uh, she has uh, missed one thing in her bio, that her uh, labor of love of the North Shore is, is the Bible, the book of, about the natural history of the North Shore. It's a marvelous book. And I highly recommend that you pick it up. I have a, I have a signed copy that they're worth a lot. They're just priceless, uh, but it's a fantastic book. She's done a great job of pulling that together. It is, it is a, a, a beautifully written framework of the natural history of the North Shore. And, um, we were filming her uh, last year, and I was so uh, taken by her, some of the comments she made, which is, I love April. There's one up here. I can go out and explore. It's just beautiful. I'm going, well, hold it. April stinks. You know, it's just, it's, it's mucky. It's wet. Uh, and then she said, forest bathing is cool. Just go out by yourself. Make sure you don't take a friend who likes to talk or go fast. You just should be out in the woods by yourself. So with, uh, with that, I will let them tell some stories about the North Shore. Uh, Katya also has a book that is, is wonderful. So I got to make sure that we um, give uh, kudos to our, our presenters tonight. If you've been here before, you know that John Shepard will also talk about some of our multimedia materials. Uh, anything that, uh, that our friends have done, we make available in uh, both uh, to the general public and to a K-12 audience. So with that, um, I'll over to our uh, pr uh, our team that's going to be presenting. And I think first up, Katya and Mark, if you guys are ready to go, you can go ahead and take over the screen. We will. We're going to share our screen here and get you on a slideshow. Can everyone see that? I can. First, I just want Shell, for you to know that we have your book in our boat. It's the things that we give to our crew to learn about Lake Superior and climate change and the North Shore. It is incredibly thorough. Yeah, one of our critical resources that we have on board. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Take it away, Captain. <laughs> All right. So we have been sailing on Lake Superior for uh, many, many years. And um, uh, we have been doing sea change since 2014. And, uh, you know, and, and we just, we started out sailing on Lake Superior because we just love sailing on Lake Superior. And uh, let's see if we can get this to advance here. And uh, we've, uh, you know, we're a, we're a sailing, we have two daughters uh, now who are 17 and 19. Um, but since they were infants, we've been taking them sailing on various trips, and we've done two year-long trips down to the Bahamas with them, and and you know tens of thousands of miles actually uh, on Lake Superior and, and beyond. But in 2012 and 13, we did a trip um, on Amicus Two, which is this red sailboat. This is our expedition sailboat that we use uh, to do our trips, and you know prior to that, we had known about uh, climate change and the, uh, the impacts, but you know, at that time it was like global warming and it was something that was out there, but we you know, really didn't know a lot about. But then on that trip, only for a year, it was really front and center for us. And especially we uh, got caught in one of the biggest hurricanes ever recorded at the time was Hurricane Sandy. And that really woke us up to the impacts, um, especially along the Atlantic coast, because after that, 
we were safe. We were anchored up a river and, um, you know, it was exciting, but it wasn't necessarily dangerous for us. But, uh, <clears throat> but what was dangerous for us afterwards was just how sort of decimated the, uh, the eastern seaboard was after this and how the infrastructure was, um, had just broken down. It just couldn't keep up with, you know, all the damage. And, uh, and we continued all the way down into Bahamas to see that. And then we started to look back at the Great Lakes that we had just gone through and, and it occurred to us, well, you know what, the, the lower Great Lakes, including Lake Superior, they were at like almost record lows, and particularly the lower Great Lakes were four feet below normal. And, um, and so we did that trip and we got back and we started doing our own little research and started to see that, you know, there's a lot of impacts of climate change on Lake Superior. And, and so, you know, we are educators um, from way back, you know, when I first met Tracy, actually, that was at a, a camp where we were teaching canoeing and uh, wilderness skills together. And, um, and so we decided, well, what can we do to help advance the discussion of climate change? Um, and particularly, let's focus on the here and now and uh, what's going on with Lake Superior. And so we created this program called Sea Change Expeditions. It's a very grassroots mom and pop uh, kind of program. And we, we started by saying, okay, we're going to take three maze over the course of three different maze and circulate the lake and stop and talk to as many people who will, will listen to us about what's happening with climate change. And then we did that and we had, we were so well received. I mean, people just want to know about this stuff, it seemed like. So we just can, and we've lapped the lake several times now. And um, each year we, we pick a different section of the lake and visit primarily uh, school groups now uh, as we do that. With young adults as our crew when they're presenting to the public and schools. Right. So that's the critical piece. We have young adults, college age students with us. We have four on board. We're actually, we just started this year's program on uh, Sunday. And so we have four really high powered um, young women on board right now who, uh, and we did our first program at a local school today. So, so here's a few trips that we've done uh, on the lake. And like I said, each year we pick a, a different route. Okay, so getting to the, you know, the, we want to talk about more specifically about what's happening on Lake Superior right now. Um, the, there's several things that are happening. Well, probably more than several. Um, but sort of the chief one is that it is warming. The lake is warming. And sort of a, a climate story that we have, or a Lake Superior story that we have, is in 2010. This is actually before we started change. We were coming across the lake on a calm day, and we had some uh, guests on board coming back from a trip. And I have a little thermometer readout thing on, on the boat where it reads what the temperature of the water is about three feet under the surface. And it said we were, you know, it was late July, flat calm, uh, like you can see here, and it read 72 degrees, 10 miles offshore. And, you know, and three feet under. Yeah, and we had been sailing for many years and, and uh, never saw anything like that. And so we, um, you know, I thought the thermometer was broke. So we stopped. And he stuck my foot in the water and it was like, whoa, this is like bath water. So, okay, everyone get their suits on. We're going to jump in and we're going to actually swim around the boat and not just jump in and jump out like you normally do because this will never happen again. This is a once in a lifetime thing on Lake Superior. And so we did. And the reality now, though, is that it's uh, since then, you know, we record water temperature and clarity throughout the summer. And and uh, since then, it has gotten into the 70s, uh, you know, every, every summer uh, at some point. And, uh, and in fact, on the, on, along the south shore where it's shallower, there's been uh, temperatures up into the 80s, actually, in some of the bays. And so that is one of the big things that is happening. And that's having a lot of repercussions um, 
uh, around the lake to the, uh, with the ecology of the lake. Um, so what we say is, you know, when you hear the, un, the unthinkable becomes the norm, like that's our story for that. What was unthinkable was, and if you talk to anyone, you know, parents are on the lake, they will laugh at you if you say you're swimming in the lake, but it has become commonplace. And, it, and really it started uh, right around 1980 uh, or the early 80s is when you really started to see a lot of things shifting with temperature uh, on the lake and around on the basin with the boreal forest as well. And so, you know, the pretty much every winter now the water temperatures uh, you know, we're breaking records. And, uh, and so like the, the thing that happens there is that when you have um, warmer water, ultimately that's gonna mean less ice and then less ice is gonna mean warmer water. And Lake Superior uh, water temperature is actually something like twice the rate of the air temperature. And, uh, and it's depending upon how you wanna measure, it's the fastest, uh, warming large lake in the world uh, and a lot of that is uh, because of our higher latitude. And also because of our, how quickly we're losing ice. Yeah and so here's here's the thing about the ice. So ice is a critical piece um, as far as the ecology of the lake is concerned. You know the the um, a lot of the fish spawning and other organisms right down to the plankton are you know, they sort of have evolved on the lake based on having a certain amount of ice cover every year on the lake, you know, on average. And so what's happening now more and more is that, you know, historically what you would see is this bell curve of ice, right? So earlier in the, you know, December, it starts to freeze. And then, um, you know, by late February into March, it sort of peaks out and then gradually starts to melt in May. And so there's a significant period there where you have, you know, a, a fair amount of ice on the lake. And one of the things that does is it reflects the sun's energy um, back into the atmosphere. So when you have ice, the, you know, instead of the lake absorbing the sun rays and heating it, it reflects it off and keeps it cooler, right? And so, uh, what we're seeing though now more and more because of our warming winters is that we will get like no ice, no ice, no ice, and then we'll get one of these polar vortex things like we did, you know, uh, this winter and uh, particularly in 2000 uh, or in, in 21, it was a great example of this because we had no ice, no ice, and then we had this 13 day period where up here it was just you know below zero like highs for the day were below zero we actually hit i think 38 or 40 below a couple times and or I, actually we did hit 40 below and and so during that time period there was suddenly it suddenly went from like almost no ice to like 50 percent ice or more in some areas and but then we had a where we had in the course of four days up here, it went from literally 40 below zero to 40 degrees above zero. So that's an 80 degree temperature difference and all that ice melted. So, you know, when you look at a graph like this uh, overall and you see that, you know, in the year 2021, well, that wasn't so bad. They had like almost 50% ice cover. Uh, but the reality is they had it for two weeks rather than, you know, three months. And, and so now they're, they're actually taking a look at how they record ice uh, cover on the lake and now having it sort of take into uh, account the, the length of time the ice was there uh, rather than uh, in addition to the percentage of the ice. And so here you can see uh, you know, the difference between, uh, I think, March 3rd and the, the date on the upper one is um, covered up, but there's, I think that's about a 13-day period. Upper one, you can see all that ice that formed, that white stuff on the lake, that's all ice, that just formed in a matter of days, and then it disappeared as soon as it warmed up. What we do a lot of is teach kids about this stuff and like, look at that, like that is a stressed ecosystem. It's so different one year to the next. And so we try to 
help kids get into, like, if you're a human, you have heat, you have air conditioning, you can adapt. But if you're a tree and you lose your leaves early, then what? If you're a snowshoe hare and you turn white at the wrong time, then what? So, you know, this is a, a system that is stressed out because the change is so dramatic year to year. And, you know, some of the impacts of, of just the ice cover, you know, like the whitefish, for instance, um, where they spawn, they assume that that area is going to get frozen over and to protect their eggs. And so if you don't have the ice cover to do that, it can affect the, uh, the like the whitefish population. Also, there's these uh, plants called Arctic disjuncts that are found um, in these microclimates along the North Shore on the real rocky cliffs, uh, you know, primarily say north of say Taconite Harbor, there's some a bit south, but, but most of them are up in the northern part of the lake. They grow right on the edge in the most extreme sort of conditions along the lake shore. And, uh, and they have adapted to the ice kind of scouring that every year. Uh, and so, and that scouring ice keeps a lot of the other plants at bay. Right, and so now without that kind of ice cover as frequently, some of these other plants are encroaching on them and, um, and they're losing their, their habitat, essentially. But, you know, why do we care really that, that the lake is warming? A lot of kids sort of ask that because, you know, it's the lake is so cold, you don't really swim in Lake Superior uh, unless you're in some areas uh, where it's shallow, like there's, uh, but like on, along the North Shore, for instance, you know, there's very few spots uh, where it's shallow enough or sandy enough to actually warm up, up enough to actually go swimming. Like we, we live about a block from the lake and we dip all summer, uh, but it's more like jump in and, and quick get out. But as the lake is warming, especially here's a shot in the Apaza Islands, one of the things that happens is you get algae blooms where, you know, algae is a natural part of the uh, e ecosystem or ecology of the lake. It's supposed to be there. Um, you know, it's uh, many, the whole food chain basically, um, you know, uh, relies on, on sort of a constant or consistent algae growth in the lake. We do, uh, you know, water clarity studies in the lake uh, where we do a secchi dis uh, uh, during our trips. And, you know, this time of the year, we'll get up to like 60, 70 feet of water clarity because the algae really hasn't started to grow in the lake. But in July, you might get 40 feet or something like that. It's still quite clear. But the reason you're not getting that clarity in most cases is because of the natural algae growth. But now as the water warms rapidly rather than slowly, you know, normally you would get, again, this bell curve of algae growth over the winter. And, uh, and or over the summer, but as these water temperatures are warming, increased algae growth into the point where you get these algae blooms. And then of course, you're looking at fish kills and other organisms can't survive uh, because of all the oxygen is sucked out of the water. But I would say, you know, one of the biggest issues with the warming waters on Lake Superior and, and, and one of the things we wanna be most concerned about right now is the zebra and the quagga mussels. So currently, you know, Lake Superior has probably around 90, 80 to 90 uh, invasive species in the lake. If you go to the lower Great Lakes, you know, Lake Michigan, they might have like 180. It's like an invasive nightmare in the, the lower Great Lakes. And a lot of that has to do with they're just, the water temperatures down there are just so much warmer. And for a long time, uh, the researchers didn't think that zebra mussels or quaggas could survive in Lake Superior because the water uh, temperature was too cold for them in general. And, uh, but now uh, that's not true. So we have uh, found, and here's, these are just, if you're not familiar with the zebra and the quagga mussels, there's just these little tiny little clam-like things that attach themselves. So the zebras attach themselves more to pilings uh, and structures, and then the quaggas are more on the bottom, uh, and they can sort of carpet the bottom. But they they just they're invasive, and they have uh, really no real predators to speak of, and they just reproduce really rapidly. 
And so now on the lake, you know, you can find them in pretty much all the major ports around the lake. And they even have reproducing populations out on Iowa Oil right now. And originally these came in uh, in ballast water uh, on salties we call them. Lake Michigan is now uh, Lake Michigan is now the clearest of the Great Lakes because of their zebra and quagga mussel populations down there have filtered the water so much that, that it has incredible water clarity, but it's it's becoming more devoid of life because of the uh, lack of plankton in the water. Just a quick check in, Tracy. Are we fine with time? I heard the recording go off and on. Okay, we got a couple more things. Okay. All right, so another invasive species that we have is the, uh, the um, sea lamprey. And of course now the sea lamprey has been in the lake since, oh, I don't know, many, many years it's been in the lake. But it, it started, I think it eventually, uh, originally came through the Erie Canal, if you can believe that. But, um, and eventually worked its way up into uh, Lake Superior and all along the way it decimated the lake trout populations of all the lakes, including uh, Lake Superior. And we have interviewed a lot of old timers on these trips and the stories they told about, you know, back in the 50s when the sea lamprey were just really destroying the, the, the lake trout population was just in, in very disheartening the way they described their whole industry just, um, you know, being destroyed by these things. And so now they have a thing called lampricide that they've been able to use, uh, you know, for many years now to control them. But it's very costly to do this, and um, and with the warming waters, it's beginning to affect the like their spawning season. So there is some research being done to see if um, they'll have to do use more lampricide over a longer period of time to really control the the sea lamprey. Because they'll they'll come right back. I mean, they're they're still in the lake, but you hardly ever see them because of the, the sea lamprey. And, and it's really a cool story. The whole thing behind the the, the sea lamprey. Okay, we got to we're somehow we we advanced a little bit too quickly. Let's just okay. Real briefly, this is the spiny water flea, another invasive that we're paying a lot of attention to, and we actually troll for it. It's tiny, tiny, um, but it's, you know, another big food chain issue, and this is one that speaks to fishermen because it can really hang up their lines. And there, here's another one. This is not an invasive species, but it is something that is becoming um, prohibitive because of warming water. So one of the things that's happening on Lake Superior with its warming waters is we're getting a lot more of this brown slime on the, the rocks. And we're at a mooring ball in Taconite Harbor on the North Shore. And we went to pull up the line to tie off to our boat and this is what we came up with. Just all really gnarly, gnarly brown slime. That shouldn't be like that. Yuck. All right, and I think we're yep. the, so, I think we're pretty much out of time, right? Yeah, so we're we have you know lots of things we can always share about what's happening to lake specifically. We talk about storms, the um, expense of climate change, and then you'll hear probably more about this with your our other speaker. Um, and then we talk about microplastics, another huge thing on Lake Superior. Microfibers from our clothes are one of the biggest things happening in Lake Superior right now. Um, so that's the end of our presentation. And um, there's always lots more, but thanks for listening to that part. And we'll take questions maybe after. I don't know when, but thank you. Right. Katya and Mark, thank you both. Um, 
Yes, please, if you do have questions, uh, note them in the chat. And once we're through with all of the three presentations, we will open it up for questions and dialogue at that point. So thanks so much for sharing that. Um, Shella, if you're ready, I will go ahead and uh, open up your PowerPoint and you can um, kind of direct me in sharing that. Are okay. you good, you good uh, to go? Yep, I'm ready whenever you are. Okay. I will get this going and feel free to turn on your video if you want to. So if people can see who you are. I want them to focus on, <laughs> okay. on the lake and the land. Well, thanks for inviting me to this presentation, all you good folks at Hamlin. And nice to be with you all out there in the audience. Lake Superior beckons us to look out, to get lost in awe and wonder. I'm going to shift our view 180 degrees to the lake's watershed, the other part of a magnificent hole. Next. I wanna give you a quick primer. As teachers, these are the things that I would wanna know if I were gonna teach someone about the North Shore, plant communities, and Lake Superior's watershed. I'm going to focus on a few native plant communities that dominate the Lake Superior watershed of Minnesota's North Shore. Next. Oops. Sorry. As with any lake or river, Lake Superior is in an intimate conversation with the land in the watershed. The lake's size, temperature, and geography bring additional elements to their conversation, and their communications involve many realms, temperature, precipitation, and chemistry, to name a few. Next. Given the depth and importance of this connection between the lake and watershed, I thought I would frame this quick tour with one of the most direct and easily grasped ways the land interacts with the lake. Water moving from the land to the lake via the North Shore's streams and rivers. Next. Let's begin with a look at the big picture of a representative part of the watershed's vegetation. In this color infrared satellite image, different NPCs in the landscape are revealed by different colors. Remember that all these plant communities represent not just plants, but habitat the homes of the terrestrial life in the Lake Superior watershed. Keep in mind too, that water moves through all of them from wetlands to rock outcrops. On our tour, I'll focus on native plant communities in these two dominant but fundamentally different upland forest systems. Next. If you're unfamiliar with the term music, think consistently moist. We'll also check out the Lake Superior shoreline, all but invisible on the satellite image, and I'll cover distinctive community characteristics, then threats and some ways in which those threats are being addressed in each one. For purposes, could you go back? I said we wouldn't do this, but could you go back, John? Thank you. For our purposes, key information displayed in this image are the differences in the vegetation including fire-dependent and mesic hardwood forest communities. In the image's mosaic, reds, greens, and yellows are fire-dependent forests, and they frame the bright gold shapes of mesic hardwood forests. Next. Most of the watershed lies well, within, well inland of Lake Superior and beyond this image in the headwaters of the major rivers. Waters begin their journey to the lake in tiny, difficult to identify rivulets that coalesce into first order streams like this one, which pool and drop as they move through forests, gaining volume as they mature. Next. They mature into higher order streams with increasing diversity of in-stream features, habitats, and complexity in the aquatic community. Next. Fire-dependent aspen birch spruce fir forest dominates much of the headwaters portion of the watershed's rivers. As the system name states, 
fire is the primary natural disturbance and a critical component of a community's cycles of life, death, and nutrients. Fires of all sizes and intensities are possible. They happen at many different intervals, and landscape-scale catastrophic fires are not uncommon. Next. Just about any plant community can burn given the right conditions, but even the largest and most intense fires are not uniform in their impacts, and skipped areas are quite common. Most species of these forests are highly adapted to fire in a variety of ways. Here we can see how readily aspen sprouts from unburned roots when the trees above are killed, quickly beginning the next generation. Next. Following a fire, nutrients released from the burning of organics supply an initial flush of new growth by fire-adapted species. Next. Over time, as the tree canopy develops and conditions become shadier and moister, fire-sensitive species like spruce and balsam fir return, their seeds arriving on the wind from unburned areas. Next. Time and changing conditions also allow additional species of wildflowers to return. Next. Continuing toward Lake Superior, North Shore streams combine with others, becoming rivers that follow deep valleys they've made through the old mountains and massive hills of glacial moraine that tower above the lake's shore. Next. Those bright gold shapes of Mesa hardwood forest on the satellite image, Topographically, along this part of the shore, they are positioned on the tops and upper lake-facing slopes of the Sawtooth Mountains and are missing from the headwaters landscape north of the mountains and the lower lake-facing slopes. Their location is no accident. When the climate here cooled beginning about 3,000 years ago, the ways in which the microclimate created by Lake Superior interacts with the highlands of the Sawtooth Ridge and Morainal Hills was and remains key to sustaining conditions favorable to next. Conditions favorable to the North Shore sugar maple forest. This is just one example of the powerful connection between the lake and the land. Without it, this community of life would no longer exist here. Next. As you no, no doubt guessed, sugar maple is the dominant species of these forests. In addition to the gorgeous party colored display it offers in the autumn, sugar maple is a powerful influencer of ecosystem function and processes within the community. Next. In sharp contrast to fire dependent forests, fire has no role in the consistently shady, moist, humid and comparatively cool conditions of the mesic forest. Sugar maples and other trees range from seedlings to mature trees hundreds of years old. Each fall, they shed their millions of leaves supporting a deep continuous blanket of humus. With rare exceptions, disturbances happen on a small scale when large trees lose a portion of their crown or an individual tree or small group of trees fall. There, light floods the otherwise continuous canopy of shade, and plants make the most of these opportunities with growth spurts. A thriving and mighty community of invertebrates and fungi do the essential work of returning nutrients locked up in leaves and wood to the community by decomposing the dead. Large, coarse, woody debris in various states of decay is always present providing reliable, moist habitat, even in dry times. The sponge-like decaying wood soaking up, holding, and slowly releasing water. Next. This community's deep, rich humus supports a myriad of inhabitants, including carpets of shade-tolerant wildflowers and ferns. In it is particularly important to wildflowers known as spring ephemerals, like these, who make the most of the spring light emerging to bloom before trees leaf out and shade envelops the understory. Next. Moving through south through the Sawtooth Mountains, lower slopes, 
The North Shore rivers make contact with ancient bedrock. Next. There they drop precipitously and tumultuously through deep bedrock canyons carved over thousands of years. Next. And pass through what I'll refer to as the near shore fire dependent forests. One fundamentally different, similar to those of the headwaters, but different too. Again, these differences arise from geography and proximity to Lake Superior which dictated a different fire frequency and intensity than that of the same forest community in the headwaters landscape. In the near shore landscape before the 19th century, much longer intervals between catastrophic fires were common, allowing the widespread development of old growth forest characteristics. Dominated by long-lived conifers like white pine, white cedar, and white spruce, they fostered a flora reliant on old forest conditions. Today's nearshore forests are primarily aspen birch spruce fir. In the watershed's time frame, this is a relatively recent change that began with, uh, when the initial wave of Euro-American resource extraction and settlement swept over the region. Next. Unprecedented disturbances, including intense cut and run harvest over the entire area, fires set to facilitate mining exploration and clearing for homesteads wrought direct and dramatic changes to near shore forests. Next. From the late 1800s through the 1930s, what remained of the near shores forest was repeatedly ravaged by intentional fires and wildfires of unprecedented frequency and intensity. The cumulative effects of all these novel disturbances was a forest community composition and processes were radically altered and the extent of some much diminished. Next. Among the losses was a great diminishing of mesic pine forest and the community of life impoverished in what remains. Next. The same is true for upland white cedar forest, and both white pine and white cedar are far less common than they once were in other upland forest communities. Next. The aspen birch spruce fir forest that dominates today is an artifact of the radical disturbances of the past. And at around 100 years since that time, relatively young as a community, this is reflected in both the tree canopy of fire adapted birch and aspen, which are first to establish following catastrophic disturbance and next. The dominance of highly fire adapted species in the understory, next. A North Shore River's final passage is through gates of ancient bedrock, next. Other than small stones of cobble or gravel beaches, bedrock comprises most of the Minnesota shoreline and is home to the Lake Superior bedrock shore community. Next. The bedrock foundation of the shore meets the lake in many forms, from broad to narrow, gradual to steep, smooth or broken, all with direct implications for which and how plants make their home there. Next. In the highly dynamic environment of waves, wind, and ice, next. The degree of protection from these forces has a profound influence on the expression of the community, next. One of the most successful strategies for living on the bedrock shore is keeping your head down. And most of the plant life in the community does just that. A remarkable lichen flora thrives on the bedrock surface. The less exposed to the lake's waves and ice, the richer and more diverse. Next. Herbaceous and woody plants find a home where they can. Trees and shrubs are typically stunted and gnarled into crumholtz forms, shaped by wind, waves, and ice. They are the original bonsai. Next. On the upper portion, of wider shoreline or where the bedrock's microtopography offers some protection from waves and ice scour, 
The community includes showy species of shrubs and wildflowers. Next. As unlikely, even impossible as it might seem, some of the most delicate plants reveal the strength of their evolutionary heritage as they grip the shore close to the enormous and powerful lake growing only a few inches high from tiny cracks and crevices or rooted in clumps of moss. Among the community's members are Arctic and Alpine disjunct species, some of them quite rare. For some, their only home in this area is Lake Superior's bedrock shore. Part of the flora during the millennia, immediately following the retreat of the last glacier, these species were displaced from other parts of the landscape where they were outcompeted. For these pioneer species, the bedrock shore is their last stand at this latitude. Their populations now isolated, disjunct from main range populations inhabiting Arctic, near Arctic, or Alpine communities hundreds of miles away. Next. Where those just right Goldilocks conditions converge, rock shore pools support a distinctive multi-layered community of life within the broader community. Next. Mounds of densely rooted rushes and sedges commonly anchor other species near the pools and elsewhere. Next. This tightly knit community often includes Arctic disjunct species like small asphodel in the upper left, bird's eye primrose in the bottom, and the insectivorous butterwort. Next. Now to some threats to the Lake Superior's North Shore watershed. Like watersheds everywhere, there are and will continue to be wide ranging impacts related to climate change. Among them, changes to fire frequency and intensity, plant species range changes, changes to native insect pollinators, increases in native and non-native pests, and damage to their hosts, changes in the effects of diseases, both native and introduced. Any and all of these contribute to the collapse of native plant communities. In the North Shore area, awareness of climate change related threats is high. Individuals, organizations, and local communities are taking action in various ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, from improving energy efficiency to switching to solar energy. One North Shore municipality, Grand Marais, has been making strides on a climate action plan for about 10 years. The town's elected council and the board of the county where it's located unanimously passed this winter a resolution declaring a climate emergency, establishing an assessment of climate impacts as a mandatory element of decision making, and calling on all other levels of government to do the same. Next. I've noted how 18th and 19th century unregulated harvest and novel fire disturbances created radical forest change. Next. Unfortunately, it took most of the century since then to make much meaningful change in forest management. Clear cut and monoculture plantations are still used inappropriately, resulting in undesirable loss of forest structure and diversity. Next. In the past couple decades, public agencies responsible for most of the watershed's forests have made progress toward more ecologically based management practices. Next. The near shore forest in particular is uniquely threatened by multiple factors. Beyond those immediate losses of mature forest in past catastrophic disturbances, there was destruction of regeneration and seed sources of some species, which interrupted the process of forest change over time. This slowed and limited the regeneration of long-lived conifers in particular, especially white pine and white cedar, beneath the initial canopy of birch and aspen. In many places a hundred years later, those first canopy trees have reached the end of their lives and there are few trees to replace them and sustain a forested community. 
Next. Another major contributing factor is that white pine and white cedar are prime winter foods of white-tailed deer, which moved into this area in the early 20th century, attracted to the dramatic change in forest composition and conditions, which provide a new usable habitat. Next. As this image of the vegetation within and outside of a deer exclosure shows, deer browsing impacts are severe on both woody and herbaceous plants. Woody plants are particularly at risk in areas like the near shore forest where deer congregate in large numbers during the winter, taking advantage of shallower snowpack depths than those farther inland. In the face of these threats and those related to climate change, conservation organizations, state and federal land managers and private landowners have initiated their own and collaborative programs to improve the chances for a near shore forest of some kind in the future. By planting long-lived conifers and other carefully selected native species and genotypes whose ranges lie just south of the near shore and protecting them from deer, they endeavor to foster a future near shore forest and one with a chance to survive in both the present and future climate. Next. Introductions and spread of exotic or non-native organisms are another realm of threats. Plants, earthworms, gypsy moth, emerald ash borer, and white pine blister rust, to name a few, are here or moving closer each year. Next. The introduction and spread of non-native plants like these can overwhelm native species, eliminating members of forest and shoreline communities leaving the community more vulnerable to other threats like climate change. Next. Once upon a time, the North Shore watershed was buffered to some degree by its remoteness, small human population, and comparative lack of development. But that era is past. Substantial direct loss of forest communities from human-created disturbances continues, especially in the near fo shore forest. Without intention and concerted action, each development also expands opportunities for the spread of new non-native plant populations. Ongoing public and nonprofit education seeks to increase awareness of this threat and offer various programs to control some known populations of the most invasive and destructive plant species. This is very challenging work and addressing the underlying causes is even more difficult. Next. Once a low key vegetation destination beginning after World War II, recreation has exploded here on the North Shore since the late 1980s and is now a thriving and powerful local industry. The North Shore draws hundreds of thousands of visitors pursuing a wide range of recreational activities. Next. Residents and visitors alike want to be out in the woods and along the shore. Hundreds of miles of trails and other facilities have been built to accommodate them. Though the impacts are perhaps less obvious than some other developments, the creation of trails at the density seen now through otherwise intact forest communities is a long-term threat to those communities' ecological integrity through canopy loss, erosion, and the spread of non-native species. Though the bedrock shore is more than 100 miles long here in Minnesota, livable habitat there for plants is very limited. All too frequently, their habitat is degraded or threatened by development and recreational use. Along the bedrock shoreline, one person's walk multiplied by thousands year after year, causes damage to lichens, mosses, and eventually herbaceous and woody plants. In some state parks, the bedrock is all that remains, the community gone from heavily visited shorelines. Next. One state park confronted with severe impacts from hiking and climbing, addressed the problem by better defining a hiking route creating raised platforms for climbers to stage on, 
and installed fixed climbing anchors for them to use instead of trees. They also undertook the very difficult and long-term effort to restore native plants to the large damaged areas. Next. Lake Superior and its North Shore watershed, my home, face numerous threats. But unlike a lot of other places, many native plant communities here remain relatively intact and ecologically functional and will benefit from actions we humans take locally and everywhere to support their future and ours. Next. Wherever we live or visit, we're part of a watershed. Living our lives to belong there in support to the whole community of life is an essential part of being fully human and living life to the fullest. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Shell, that was awesome. Shell. Um, and uh, I'm going to um, open up my browser, if you'll bear with me for one second here. Let's see here. See, and I'm going to just give, in, in our time remaining, uh, give you all an overview of the work that uh, kind of ties together the pieces that uh, have been shared with you uh, so far. And uh, let's see if this is gonna open up here. Hang on. We have the spinning wheel it's telling me it can't be reached. And we'll try a different route here. And while this is hopefully going to boot up successfully, um, I want to give a just a special shout out to um, to Katya and to Mark and to Shell. All three of you uh, have been wonderful partners uh, working with us. Uh, as we've been uh, developing educational resources uh, for uh, about Lake Superior for use with public audiences and, and K-12 schools. Um, and uh, just to say a little bit more about that, and I am flummoxed here why this isn't actually opening. Pardon me. Let me see what we've got going on here. Uh, I'm sorry, just bear with me one sec while I try and get this opening up. Can you all hear me okay? Am I? Okay. Um, I don't know if this is a browser problem. Tracy, do you want to see if you can get your um, yours to share? I'll see if this is going to work. Oh, I think I'm good now. Possibly. Okay, here we go. Never mind. We're back in business, I think. So my apologies to everybody. Um, all right. Um, <clears throat> so once again, um, Shell and Katya and Mark have been our partners in doing this work. Um, and what the work consists of is uh, really a four-part effort to provide uh, rich educational uh, and stewardship resources for uh, residents of the North Shore 
Lake Superior as well as visitors uh, and also to the K-12 schools, teachers and students. And uh, Katia and Mark are uh, have been very uh, great partners in, in the school presentations that they are giving up and down the North Shore. Um, they're uh, incorporating their stories and rich resources from gain from living on the lake with um, uh, sharing the, uh, the multimedia resources we have available. Uh, Shell has been very generous in allowing us to, to um, interview her and uh, tap her great experience and knowledge in, in telling some of these stories. So uh, really appreciate your partnership. Um, the projects we are working on, this what you're seeing right now is uh, Lake Superior, the North Shore Multimedia Gallery. So this is a program that is running on uh, about a 13 or 14 uh, computer kiosks that are placed in high traffic areas along the North Shore, uh, all the major state parks, uh, highway rest areas, the Maritime Museum in Canal Park, uh, Fitgers uh, Hotel, uh, Odyssey Resorts. So these are uh, large format uh, kiosks that you see in, in museums frequently that have hours of content. And uh, we've adapted the same uh, multimedia stories for use in schools, and that is played over the internet. Uh, very parallel uh, program with much of the same content. Uh, we have a smartphone app uh, called our Pocket Gallery that is a free download uh, that also carries the same content. And we are uh, working on a series of broadcast documentaries with WDSE, the PBS affiliate in Duluth. So all of these resources are, uh, are working together to share some common stories. So I'm gonna give you a brief overview of um, what we have uh, available and what I'm, um, I'm gonna, for, and again, all this content is, is um, adapted for schools as well. So this is the main menu screen and each of the thumbnails along the bottom is a different category of content. So I'll just kind of go through this quickly to give you an overview. This is a version that we are developing right now for uh, St. Louis County and uh, the Duluth Depot, which is one of our sponsors. So their content is on the left here. The Wild Shore is an introductory video that celebrates the uh, incredible uh, natural uh, heritage of the shore. Uh, lake Superior has content exploring the lake, much of uh, some of the stories you heard from Katia and Mark. Rivers and Watersheds taps into a lot of the things Shell was talking about. St. Louis River Estuary is an area of special concern that we focus on. The estuary is a very large freshwater estuary, one of the, uh, which is a relatively rare occurrence of really large uh, freshwater estuary. So the St. Louis River empties into uh, the western end of Lake Superior here uh, with Duluth on the Minnesota side and Superior, Wisconsin on the other side. And it's an area that has been highly uh, impacted uh, for many decades by um, a number of uh, industrial impacts, uh, heavy industry, um, uh, extensive logging operations um, uh, that uh, in combination, uh, a lot of activity in the harbor, there's been significant impacts on the entire ecosystem and a huge project has been underway for uh, uh, some 30 years to try and uh, restore the uh, estuary to its health. And Barb Huberty is with us tonight. Uh, again, a shout out to you, your, your support and interest in working with us. So we've captured a number of stories here. Uh, most of these are videos that have been produced by uh, organizations that are working to clean up the estuary, each of them a short video that um, allows exp exploration of some of the topics there. Uh, we also have content from the Fond du Lac uh, band. Uh, there's a uh, an island, Spirit Island here, which is considered sacred ground for the Fond du Lac uh, community and uh, a series of videos exploring that as well. So I'm going to, I'm kind of moving quickly, going to give you an overview of what's in here and then look a little bit at a couple of the um, uh, contents. Uh, fun and Games, um, the K-12 version has a slightly different uh, name for that, but the content is very similar. We have an interactive program called Storm Drain Goalie, and this is all about learning about how impacts 
uh, from storm the storm drain system in urban areas, uh, the kinds of impacts that uh, pollution that enters our storm drains has on bodies of water like Lake Superior. And you heard Katia and Mark talking about the warming of the lake and the nutrients that are delivered to the lake through stormwater systems uh, are part of the problem of creating the algae bloom. So this is a whole interactive program exploring that issue in, a, in kind of a very uh, interactive and kind of game-like fashion. We actually created a game called Storm Drain Goalie, where you uh, click this game and we have pollutants that are streaming down toward the storm drain. And your job is to keep the pollutants out of the storm drain um, and uh, allow the water uh, to flow through. So that's kind of a fun game-like element uh, that's part of our um, kind of our fun and games portion. Um, rich content about um, kind of natural systems. Uh, Shell was talking about North Shore habitats and she has helped us uh, develop profiles of some of the key habitat types. So this is a, a white cedar uh, forest area. We have 360 panorama uh, interactive panoramas. This is uh, maybe familiar to some of you. This is a um, uh, cedar grove uh, at Oberg Mountain, uh, very close to the trail. You walk right through this as you uh, enter the trail from the parking lot there with interpretive information on the left-hand side there, uh, on the right-hand side of the caption. So the whole series of kind of profiling what these different habitats look like. Uh, and additional elements on, on plants and uh, on animals uh, as part of that as well. Um, geology, there's, a, there's a, a lot of geologic content. We've actually designed a learning module called uh, uh, the uh, Lava Legacy. Let's see, I think I skipped this. Oh, it's not in this version. So we've we created an interactive experience that uh, really goes back in time uh, a billion years to uh, look at the uh, this period when before Lake Superior was even formed in its current shape where the entire region would have looked a lot like uh, this, the, um, the big island in Hawaii with ex extensive uh, volcanic activity. And then we look at the the uh, the geology of uh, you know the, the how the results of, of that activity, uh, and one of the things we've got profiles of a number of rocks. This is our agate segment. These are uh, 360 uh, rock movies uh, that you can interact with to learn about different types of agates. And we're going to be adding uh, geologic other uh, types of, of, of rocks to this uh, ge geology experience. Uh, a lot of content on the night sky, and we're working closely with astronomers uh, in the region. Uh, there have been three dark sky sanctuaries that have been designated in northeastern Minnesota and just over the border in Ontario at uh, Voyagers National Park, Quetico Provincial Park, and the Boundary Waters Canoe Area. And um, so we've embedded uh, content related to this, uh, image galleries and videos, that are kind of celebrating the, the night sky, indigenous uh, perspectives on the stars. Um, and this has grown, uh, this work has uh, uh, kind of expanded into a, a broadcast documentary that we are currently developing um, with some of these very same folks who have helped us put this uh, information together. There's also videos about uh, light pollution, the impact of uh, the incredible changes that have been brought about by artificial lighting in uh, primarily in urban areas, both to human health, to animal health, and also uh, obscuring our, our view of the night sky. So lots of information about that. Whole segment on climate change, uh, working uh, with Katya and Mark, and also with um, uh, Climate Generation, uh, a nonprofit that based in the Twin Cities that does work um, with young people and uh, develops resources for schools. So you'll find some of the uh, in-depth content related to the subjects that um, Mark and Katya were introducing there. Um, uh, timeline and historic maps. So we have a whole uh, series of historic maps that allow you to kind of think about how, um, how Lake Superior and the Great Lakes have been conceived visually uh, through time. Um, and we have a history timeline as well. This is about a uh, runs through, I think there's 50 or 60 
high points uh, in in the his, history of of uh, uh, kind of the evolution of human relationship with natural resources in um, along the North Shore. So that's kind of social science content. Native voices, I mentioned, um, we have the, um, the uh, content from um, Fond du Lac. We also have a wonderful image gallery of honoring indigenous women water protectors. Um, and most of these uh, women are, uh, a lot of them are Anishinaabe from Northern Minnesota and Dakota, uh, from, um, uh, Dakota traditions and a number of them also from other parts of the country. So um, we've been kind of building relationships in our work with uh, Fond du Lac and the Grand Portage um, community to, to build out some of that content. Uh, so there's a section on lighthouses, shipping and fishing, uh, logging, mining and railroads. Again, kind of the natural history of the region, how humans have interacted with that over time. Um, exploring the shore, uh, portraits of the communities uh, along the North Shore. And this, this is, uh, all of this is to a degree a work in progress. We're going to be adding uh, more content as we move forward here. Um, to take a little look, the Silver Bay uh, profile includes a whole segment on taconite and uh, the journey of taconite from mine to the steel mill, which is um, obvious, as you may well know, most of you, a very important part of the economy of the region. So this is a series of videos that uh, the image in the background is what you see if you're driving along Highway 61 through uh, Silver Bay, these giant industrial facilities and what we've uh, done working with um, uh, a, a former employee of um, North Shore Mining is, uh, and with video resources we've put together, tell the story of what happens as throughout this process as iron ore is brought from uh, 47 miles away in Babbitt by train to this area. And then as that um, is processed through those videos. Um, we also have a 360 tour of kind of showing what, how these buildings look and uh, when you're driving down the highway and how you can um, know where you are and so forth. A lot of content about recreation. Uh, we have segments on the, the uh, Superior Hiking Trail. And then the artist view, um, we now have uh, a couple of elements here. We're gonna be adding a, uh, more here as well. So working with uh, Cook County Historical Society, uh, we have some image galleries from some prominent artists of the North Shore celebrating um, their interpretations of some of the landscapes that you find there. Um, and then lastly, um, we have a, a section on stewardship. And here, uh, kind of building off of the storm drain goalie concept, uh, we have uh, an opportunity for folks to engage with our adopt a drain program, which uh, is a project where anyone in Minnesota can adopt a storm drain in front of their house, or uh, if it's a school, it could be in front of their school, and then uh, pledge to keep pollutants out of out of the drain and uh, engage and then report back their their um, their efforts and it's a a great way for people to have a very concrete thing that they can do uh, in their in their backyards or in their schoolyards. We have a whole series of activities associated with climate action, uh, and then there's a segment on uh, reducing aquatic invasive species through for those that are uh, using uh, boat ramps and and uh, boats. And finally, the, there's a segment with our uh, smartphone app um, that uh, is, enables people to download that and access that. So um, we are pushing close to the end of our time. We will uh, put out uh, some links uh, in the chat and, and in our follow-up materials so that uh, those of you out there who want to explore these resources, um, you're able to do so. So I'm going to stop talking and stop sharing. Thank you for your time. And um, we have a few minutes left for questions and discussion. So Tracy, you can go ahead and lead that part. All right. Uh, and just to be clear, uh, what John shared is what's for the general public at the at, uh, multimedia galleries. That same program is available for K-12 uh, audience as well. So if we can put that in the, in the link as well. Um, 
it's it's two ways of, of reaching different uh, public uh, populations um so one thing i was i think we're we you know we've uh, we're really at our time i'll take a couple of uh, the questions have been asked in the chat room most of them have been answered but i did want to uh take the one to mark and katya about what are you finding school children youth are most concerned about or excited about concerning climate change on lake superior what um uh, can you talk about that? I think that that education piece is so important. Yeah, well, we, you know, we originally didn't really know what we were going to get when we started going to schools. We knew we had to find a teacher that was really um, on fire about having us in there and would arrange the whole thing. And um, we just really have found um, kids to be happy to hear it. You know, they don't have guilt the same way adults do. Um, and these are a lot of kids that do come from fairly um, old school homes or conservative homes where I don't think they're hearing it from their parents, but it doesn't seem like kids, you know, they're just, they just take it all in and it's like, um, we got a problem, time to solve it. And we have them, we, we really try to keep it very positive. We have this huge map that our crew painted one year out of an old sail of Lake Superior and the kids get to sign it if they are committed to keeping the lake clean, cold, and clear. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean there are some things that are very tangible. Plastic is a really easy thing. Everyone's against plastic <laughs> and uh, everyone can do something about single-use plastic, you know, every day. So there are, you know, those tangible can do things that they can really make a difference. Uh, there's also some other questions popping up. Should I just go ahead and answer them? Yes, I think that'd be perfect. Yes, please do. Um, what schools we, you know, we mostly stick to the lake schools, but we have branched out and we will do a Zoom with any school. You can find on our website virtual presentations. Um, we also travel sometimes, uh, it just depends on our schedule and um, we really love to be in person, ideally. We love to get build relationships with kids. And um, but we we definitely do presentations Zoom for any any school in the country. Um, yeah. And we also have a teacher workshop. So we've had teachers say, what about a trip for us? So now we have a three-day uh, educator workshop in in late August where uh, teachers can live on the boat and we do a lot of commiserating about how to bring climate change into schools and also cutting emissions of school pro projects and stuff like that. So any any inspired teachers are also welcome to join us. Excellent. Um, Cheryl, what do you think uh, is one thing that, um, this, this isn't in a, the question, but my question is, uh, one takeaway about the resiliency of the watersheds on the North Shore, is there something that we should think about uh, doing or uh, 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 a concept that people could help with as far as uh, managing the land or the land use? Well, I think, of course, we can each manage our own behavior. That's the place to start. And whether you live here or visit here, that applies to you. <laughs> And the more each of us coming to a place anywhere, but here to understand about the nature of the place we're visiting, the more likely we are to be able to know whether our behaviors really fit with the place or not. So we can start there. And, um, and we can advocate for policies that are based on sound ecological science when it comes to land management. Um, what is most convenient for us or is most appealing to us aesthetically aren't necessarily the best uh, foundations for policy. Uh, a good example would be uh, people um, might purchase a property in the Mesic Hardwood Forest, in the North Shore Sugar Maple Forest, and they, they create their home there. And one of the first things people often do is they want to clean up the forest. Um, the dead wood, the uh, things lying on the ground, they want to make it look nice and tidy. And in so doing, they're really interfering with the ecological processes that make that forest work. So um, the more we can understand individually and the more we can advocate for our land managers to use 
good ecological science as the basis for management, the better off the forest and us will be. Thank you. Um, any closing comments from our presenters? I think we're, we'll try to honor our time and, and, and wrap this up, but uh, thank you all so much. Uh, I'll give a brief second. Uh, any, any, any last minute comments from our presenters? Mark Just thanks for having us on. Thank yeah. you guys. We're putting our website in the chat. Beautiful. <clears throat> Well, Sarah has a few messages. We have uh, Faith River Institutes that we're doing this summer. Uh, we're hoping to do something up on, in uh, maybe up on the in the Saint uh, the the uh, Saint Louis River next summer. We do uh, work around the, the state, really around the country, I guess you'd say. Uh, and and Mark and Katja, I'm glad to hear you're taking the teachers out on the boat. That's fantastic. But uh, we'd love to look for ways to collaborate with folks uh, up in the uh, the North Shore region. But Sarah, why don't you talk just quickly about these institutes and we'll wrap this up. Yes, we've got uh, four institutes this summer, three of which are uh, River Institute ones, uh, the St. Croix River, the Mississippi River Delta down in New Orleans area, as well as the Mississippi River in various spots around the Twin Cities here. Uh, we also have the uh, Drinking Water Institute, which is Waterworks, which is later in August. Um, everyone, formal and informal educators are welcome to apply. Uh, I will send out uh, links to these in the follow-up email as well. We also have, uh, if you'd like to uh, receive continuing education units for this particular presentation, there's the link there and I'll send that out as well. Well, thank you, Sarah. With that, uh, we will be sending out the rec recording to this uh, to folks uh, so you can uh, review it if you're so inclined or share it with folks. And uh, I would just like to thank everybody involved, the Morell Foundation, uh, Sarah again, uh, John for presenting at all of these. Uh, we will take the summer off and then come back in the fall with some more uh, Waters to the Sea stories. If you have ideas, please let us know. Uh, we're certainly going to be uh, working on the Mississippi, but uh, we may uh, look, we're going to explore how to, to keep telling these stories in a broad way. So thank you so much.